So they can, they'll, they'll be able to join as well. Um, being as well that being that next Wednesday night is Purim, and so we, we, there, will, there will not be class next Wednesday night. So it's probably appropriate to, to spend some time, a few moments, discussing the, the connection between this week's Torah portion and Purim, and the time that we are in right now. Tonight is also is also a very important day. Yeah. When was the first night of Adar? Thursday. Uh, Thursday night, Friday. Was Rosh Chodesh. Friday, Friday was the first day of Adar. Is there something here for Purim that night? Wednesday night, yes. So there will be there, the, Wednesday is actually a fast day. It's called the Fast of Esther. Tanit oh. Esther. It's from sunrise to sunset. It's it's not the strictest fast day in the calendar. If, if, you, if you have a difficult time fasting, um, you, 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 it's not meant to. Uh, it's, it's, you're not supposed to put yourself in any kind of serious uh, position. But uh, it's a commemor- it's a commemoration of the the the, fa- the, the fast of Esther um, before she went in to appeal to the king, Achashverosh. It's called Tanis Esther, and. Uh, the fast of Esther actually uh, is refers specifically to, to the fast that Esther fasted. The Jewish people did not fast on that day because they were they were in battle <coughs> and uh, they were they were defending themselves the, on the thirteenth uh, of Adar. And people who are in battle are forbidden to fast. Esther was the only Jew who was safe and secure in the palace at that time, so she fasted on behalf of the entire Jewish people. So, in commemoration of that, we fast on. On, on this day. Uh, in actuality, in the story of the Megillah, the Jewish people did fast for three days and three nights. But that happened on Pesach. The, 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 the story of the, the story of Pesach, of the, of Purim, in a sense, happened on Pesach. When, when you read the story of the Megillah, when Esther goes into the king and makes the feast and calls on Haman, that actually happened on Pesach. Um, so, the, uh, yeah, and Pesach is forbidden to fast, but not, because of the, the seriousness of that time, Mordechai and Esther ordered the entire Jewish population to fast for three days and three nights. Eleven months later, eleven months later, when Achashverosh gave the decree that the Jewish people can defend themselves, and he and he sent this army to defend the Jewish people, it happened on Tanis Esther that that the Jewish people armed themselves to defend themselves, and they couldn't fast. Esther, who was in the palace, she fasted on that day. In, in, in her merit, the Jewish people were saved. That's why we fast on this day. The, the fast goes right into the reading of the Megillus. We, at the conclusion of the fast, we gather here at the shul to, uh, on next Wednesday night, and we read the Megillah. After after we read the Megillah, we break our fast and uh, with the hamantashen and, and uh, have a party. And then on Thursday, we're going to be having our during the day. There are there are four mitzvot. That a person is obligated to do on Purim. There are four mitzvahs associated with Purim. One is to hear the Megillah twice, once by night and once by day. So we do that Wednesday night and Thursday to give matanot levyonim to give to at least two poor people or institutions uh, charity, um, and to one person mishloach manot. You can give to as many people as you want. We do it. We, people go out, obviously. Is much much more than that, but the minimum is to give one person mishloch manot and to give two poor people tzedakah. And the fourth thing is to have a meal on the day of Purim itself, which we will be having here on Thursday afternoon mm-hmm. at five o'clock. Yes. Did the king know that Esther was fasting, and did he get some meaning from it? Did the king know Esther was fasting at the time? Um, at that point. Yes, I, 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 Esther concealed her identity up until, the, uh, but the whole year following, it was no secret anymore that she was a Jewess and that uh, because she she had, she revealed her identity on Pesach, eleven months before Purim happened. Uh, the timeline of Purim is confusing to many people, but basically what happened is Haman chose the month of Adar. He cast a lottery. The, the, the holiday of Purim. <laughs> I mean, the truth is that the, the, the class should really revolve around Purim some more than the, the, the portion. We don't have time to do everything. But the, the holiday of Purim is, a, Purim is a Persian word. It's the only Jewish holiday that we use a Persian, a non-Hebrew word to identify the Jewish holiday. As a matter of fact, not only do we use a non-Hebrew word, we use the, the, the word that Haman one came up with. The, the Megillah says that Haman called this day Purim 
because he cast lots. He didn't know which day to choose to, to <coughs> annihilate the Jews. He knew that he wanted to annihilate the Jews, but he didn't know which day. That's a terrible dilemma for an anti-Semite to have. What's a good day? So, that, so, so the, the Megillah says that he cast lots, and the lot fell uh, in the month of Adar. And he was very happy, the Talmud says, because he knew that Mos- Moses passed away in this month. I want to tell you that before he was started, tonight is actually the anniversary of Moses' passing. Tonight is the seventh day of Adar, and, and the seventh day of Adar is, is Moshe's yard site. And many people have a custom to fast on this day as well, tomorrow. From tomorrow, sunrise to sunset, it's called Tanit Sadikim. Also, people who are involved in Hever Kadisha, people who are involved in burial societies, mm-hmm. um, adopt this day as a personal fast day um, on Moshe's yard site. And so um, the, Tal- the Talmud says that Moshe's birthday is also tonight. Moshe, was bo- bo- Moshe, Moshe lived a complete 120-year cycle. He was born and passed away on the same day. And so tonight is actually Mo- Moses' wow. birthday and his, and his yard site. And so the Talmud says that his birthday over, overrides his yard site. And so <laughs> Haman was happy that he knew, it was, he, he didn't know that Moshe was born. And so the Talmud says it's a lucky month. It was a, it's a lucky month for the Jewish people. But he, he, the, the word lottery in Persian is poor. So the, ta- the Megillah says that when he called his day Purim, Hashem HaPur, because of the poor that Haman, the, the lottery that Haman threw, we called it the, the, the name Purim. The question is, why, why would we call our holiday by the name that, that Haman chose? Even if we're going to choose the name that Haman chose, all we have to do is convert it into Hebrew. In Hebrew, we can call it Goral, or Goralot, means lottery, Right? Why don't we call it the holiday of Goralot? Why do we have to call it Purim for? So, because everything is meant to be, all of these things tie into actually a very important thought that I was going to start the class with. This Parsha, the Balaturim writes, is a Parsha of concealment. The portion of Titzaveh is the only Parsha from the time that Moshe is born until he passes away, that his name is not mentioned at all in the parshas. When you go through this week's Torah portion, the portion of Tatzaveh, you'll see that Moses' name is not even mentioned, is not mentioned once. Every other portion of the Torah, Moshe, from the time that he's born until, it, until he passes away, his name is mentioned multiple times in every single parsha. And how here you have one, his name, his name is not even mentioned once. In Genesis too? Well, he wasn't born yet. So, so from the, Moshe is born in the first portion of Exodus, in the portion of Shemot. From, so the entire book of Exodus, the entire book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? From the time he's born until he passed away, his name is mentioned again and again and again, but not in one only in this Torah portion. So we all, many of you, may be familiar with the reason why. There are a number of reasons that are given why. Some people was brought down because this is the week of his yard site. This, this Torah portion is always read in the month of the, of the seventh of Adar, which is his yard site to show Moshe's um, omission. The the Bible term writes that in two portions from now we're going to be reading the story of the, of the episode of the Golden Calf, that when Moshe did not come down on the 40th day that the Jewish people started counting, they thought that Moshe had died on top of the mountain and he wasn't coming back down, and they immediately were bewildered, and they lost themselves, and they created a Golden Calf because they needed a leader. The Jewish people had been accustomed living in the land of Egypt for hundreds of years. They lived amongst pagans, and idolatry, and they were they were slaves in mentality. And Moshe was gone, and he wasn't coming back. And they, they immediately said, we need a new leader. And so they built this golden calf to be their new idol. Moshe comes down the mountain, and he sees what, he witnesses what happened, and he's furious, and he shatters the Ten Commandments. God tells Moshe, let us, these people are impossible. There's nothing, there's no way forward with them, Right? Let us, he, he, Hashem tells Moshe, let us, let me be, let, we'll punish these people, we'll, we need to start all over again. He says, Ve'ese otcha I'm going to make a great nation out of, out of you, Moshe. We'll start, I'm going to start all over with you. A real Jewish nation. And so then we, we, we in the Parshat Kitisa, we read, this, we read this section on every fast day. We're going to read it next Wednesday as well. Every fast day we read a portion called Vayichal Moshe. Vayichal Moshe means that Moshe begins to ask God to plead with God for forgiveness. And Moshe, says, God, Moshe tells God, no, you can't do it. He says, these are your people. You took them out of Egypt. What are people going to think that you, 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 so many miracles and you took them out with a strong arm and the whole story of Pesach. 
and then you took them into the desert and you, they ran out of merit and you lost your resolve with them, people are going to think that you couldn't get them out of the desert. That's why you killed them there, right? And so Moshe is appealing to God's, uh, you know, sense of... <laughs> is, he's trying to find one weak spot where he can challenge God again and again. Moshe challenged God again and again. Total of 120 days and nights, Moshe prayed to God to forgive the Jewish people what they'd done. And it, 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 was, it was tough sledding, but Moshe at one point in Parshat Kitisa tells God, listen, he says, if you will forgive them for what they, their terrible sin, good. But if not, I want you to erase my name from your Torah that you, writ, that you wrote. Right? Moshe says, I don't want my name mentioned in your Torah. If you're not going to forgive these people, I can't be associated with this whole Torah. Right? So God relents and he forgives them. But the Bible term says that Moshe is a tzaddik. He's a great righteous man who said, who uttered those words, take, wipe me out of your Torah. He obviously was conditional for God forgiving them. But when a, when a tzaddik says something, it has to come true somehow. So God says we're going to choose one Torah portion and symbolically that we're going to wipe your, we're going to erase your name because this, this is what you asked for. And we're going to erase your name from this Torah. So the, the, name, the portion of the tzaddik was chosen because, for, for a variety of reasons, but also because it falls around, it falls on the week of his passing. So the portion of Tetzav is a portion of concealment where Moshe's name is not mentioned. And the idea is that Moshe took upon himself this sacrifice for his people that he was willing to give up his, his name of the Torah, the five books of Moses. And uh, eventually he was successful in, his, in, in having God overturn the decree and forgiving the Jewish people. The Talmud says that there's one other book, there is only one book in all of Scripture that parallels this story, where God's name is not mentioned anywhere. God's name is mentioned in every single passage, in every single portion, in every single book of Scripture. There's no such thing as God's not being mentioned. There's only one book of the entire Tanakh, of all of the Bible, that God's name is not mentioned, and that is in the Scroll of Esther. In the Megillah, Hashem's name is not mentioned once. <coughs> the Talmud says, we're in the Torah, is there an allusion to the story of Purim? Purim, remembers is a rabbinic holiday that happened many, many years later after the Torah was given. But the Talmud says, there, we know there's a principle that there is no such thing, that there's nothing in the world that's not mentioned or alluded to in the Torah somewhere. Everything is in the Torah. Everything, every hypothe- hypothetical idea, an event that ha- it's going to happen even in the future, in the Torah. So the Talmud says, where's the story of Purim? Where's the story of the, the scroll of Esther? So the Talmud says, that it says that there's, a, there's a verse in the Torah that when the negative things happen to the Jewish people, the people are going to ask, why did these things happen? It says, V'onochi haster, aster panai bayamuhu. I will conceal my face from you on that day. So that, that, that Talmud says, this is, where, this is an illusion. The word Esther in Hebrew comes from the word astir, which means concealment. Right? The, the, the Hebrew name Esther comes from the word Esther, concealment. Her real name in the Megillah, it says her name was Hadassah. Mm-hmm. Esther's name was, it says Esther's name was Hadassah, which means a rose. And, uh, and, uh, but she was called Esther. Esther's a sign of concealment because she concealed her identity. Right? That's how she, she became queen. She did not tell her husband, Achashverosh, that she was Jewish until Mordechai told her now is the time. Mordechai told her to conceal her identity. And so, Purim is the most concealed of all the Jewish holidays. Why is it? There is no... Every Jewish holiday has an overt event, an overt miracle that happens that establishes the nature of the holiday. So... Passover, it's the stroke of stroke of midnight. There's the plague of the firstborn. There's the splitting of the sea, right? Hanukkah, there's the candles, the, the oil that cannot burn naturally, and it burns miraculously. The, 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 the people cannot defeat this mighty Syrian army, and they're victorious. What happened on Purim? Purim is a story that when you scratch the surface, is actually a very baffling story. 
because the story is that Achashverosh has an advisor named Haman who convinces him that instead of 10,000 for the, for, for the payment of 10,000 shekels, he's going to hand him over the entire Jewish people to do with him whatever he wants. Right? And so Mordechai goes to Esther and says, listen, you're the queen. Esther didn't want to go initially to tell, right? She, she, her, her identity was a secret. And she told Mordechai, if I go into the king without being summoned, you know, off with my head, you know, you know, I'll get another queen. <laughs> the only way Esther became a queen in the first place is because he decapitated his first wife, Vashti, right? So Esther, Esther didn't have a lot of confidence in her own security as being queen. So, you know, kings were madmen, right? They, they, were, they were all, from the very beginning of history, they, they were all a bunch of Henry VIII's. So the, so the, the Achishverosh was a madman. So they, she, was, she, was, she was afraid to go. Until Mordechai tells her that you have no choice, you have to go. He says, who knows if that the, this is the only reason why you became queen in the first place is for this one moment. Mordechai tells her, God will save the Jewish people without you. You don't want to do it? God will save us a different way. Because she was pushing back. She told she didn't want to go. She was afraid. And so Mordechai says, God will save us without you. But, umi odea, who knows, im le'et kazot got la malchut. The only reason is for this one moment that you became a queen in the first place, is for this one moment to stand up for your people, put your life on the line. So she said, if that's the case, gather all the people and fast for three days and three nights, and then I'm going to go in. So she goes in, and Achashverosh asks her, "Right, you know the story. What do you want?" She she pushes off. She pushes, as they say. She goes, "I want to make another party." She she wasn't ready yet. She says, "At this party, I want, you, I want to invite Haman and make a big party, and then I'll tell you what I want." And that's that 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 party happened the second night of Pesach. Yeah. There's the, uh, the a tradition that in the second seder we do something at the seder in commemoration of that party. That's, we that we have a we have a, a special food. We make a, we make mention of that because that's when the story the story the miracle of Purim actually happens on the second night of Pesach. That's when Achashverosh asks Esther, "What is it? I'll give you half of the kingdom. What do you want? You're you're nervous. You're a nervous wreck. He's, you know she's 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 falling apart, and he, she doesn't want to say what's bothering her. And finally, she says, "If it was only that we were going to become slaves, I would I would never bother the king." But there's a guy who wants to wipe out myself and my entire people, and Achishverosh has no idea what she's talking about, right? Because he's, he's always in a drunken stupor. Who is this guy? Who wants to kill you? What's going on here? And finally, she points to Haman. This is the guy. You gave him permission to kill my entire family, my five entire people. And Achishverosh says, really? I did, okay? And Haman realizes that the whole thing is collapsing. He runs outside. Achishverosh runs outside in a, in a mad rage, and Haman is collapsing on Esther begging for forgiveness, I didn't. If only I would have known that you're Jewish, I never would have done such a thing. Because Haman, he, he had no idea who she was. And Achashverosh walks in and he sees Haman all over all over her, and he gets even angrier. And he, and, and we know the story that the guard was a guard Harvona, who's standing there, and he turns to Achashverosh and he says, "You know, there's a, a gallow that Haman made because he wanted to hang Mordechai on it." And Haman Achashverosh says, "Okay, put him on the put Haman on that gallow." And right, it's a great story. Right? Everyone, knows, everyone knows the story for him. But ask yourself, what is the miracle of Purim here exactly? That a dunce of a king was willing to take money from an anti-Semite to kill the Jews. First of all, Achashosh had plenty of money. He had a ton of money. 10,000 shekels was not a lot of money for him, but the Jews were worth even less. Okay. But his wife, what are we celebrating? That, he, that his wife appealed to him and he listened to his wife over a member of his cabinet. Right? That, that, in a sense, that's, if you want to break down the story of Purim is that originally Achashverosh, uh, Haman got permission to kill the Jews. And Achashverosh is the queen, and his wife came to him and said, no, that's, that's me, and how could you... And in a split second he goes, change my mind, we're going to kill him instead. All right. That's the, the, miracle, that's the miracle of Purim, right? Where, where's the miracle? How many kings would choose a regular cabinet person over the first lady anyway? Well, maybe our administration. I have to. I, I, choose, I have to. I got to rethink that. Right? Okay. Our our administration aside. But how many how many how many kings would would sell out their own wife before somebody of their own party? Seems odd. Why is it such a miracle? The answer is 
that Esther knew that, this, that the, the decree that, that the Jewish people were facing was not a natural thing. The, the, the story of Purim is a story of great concealment. You have to understand the time that it happened and the background to it. Why are the Jews in Persia? What, 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 what was happening then? The Jews had been exiled to Babylon some 70 years earlier. The, um, <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian Empire, had exiled the Jews, destroyed the temple, the first temple that King Solomon had built, that stood for 410 years. And all the great the leaders of the, the Jewish people the were either decimated or carried into captivity to Babylon, including Hananiah, Mishal, Azariah, the prophet Daniel. They were all taken to Babylon. There was a prophecy that the, the decree was that the, the exile would last 70 years. And 70 years later, the Jewish people would be able to go back to Israel and rebuild. 70 years had gone by, and the Jewish people had not gone back to Israel yet. It was a question of when the 70 years started. Achashverosh, Persia, at, the, at that and originally was not was not an empire. Babylon was the, was a superpower. How did Persia become a superpower? Achashverosh married. Achashverosh was a commoner. He wasn't he wasn't he wasn't born into royalty. Vashti was the descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. Achashverosh married a princess. He overthrew Nebuchadnezzar and the Persian empire, and the Babylonian empire. The Babylonian Empire goes down when the Persian Empire goes up. Well, they're in, first of all, they're in close proximity to each other, right? Iraq and Iran. And so what we call present-day Iran, which is the original Persian Empire. But the, 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 ancient, the, the ascent of Achashverosh co- coincides with the Babylonian Empire going down. Seventy years later, Achashverosh, the story of Purim begins that Achashverosh is making a big party. Why is he making a big party? What's the big party? Do you know how long his party was? Anybody know? A half a year, right? 180 days. He's making a party, a huge party. And who's at this party? The Jewish people are at the party. Why is he making such a big party? He's celebrating them on the demise of the Babylonian Empire. That now he's the superpower. He's the king. He's out of the shadow of his wife, and that part, and 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 where she and, and the, the Babylonian Empire. What he's really celebrating is the fact that the Jews are not going back home. That the prophecy that Daniel, the, the, book of, the book of Daniel, the prophecy, there was a famous prophecy on the wall that Daniel read to Nebuchadnezzar, that it's not coming true. And so Nebuchadnezzar had carried off into captivity, not just the Jewish people. Many of the artifacts of the temple from Jerusalem were carried into captivity into Babylon. Achashverosh took, took, took it all over. He looted the entire, the, all the valuables of Babylon. Now Persia is the center of the world. The Talmud tells us that he put on display many of the artifacts in the temple were put on display at this party. And the Jewish people came. And they, and they, were, they came to the party. They, were, they, they came to a party celebrating their own demise. That, that the Jewish people are stuck in Persia and this is our new homeland. We're not going back to Israel. The Talmud says... This is the cause of why in heaven there was such a terrible decree against the Jewish people. Because they went to a party that was, number one, they, they went to a party that denigrated all of, all of Judaism and the, and, and the, and the future of, of Jewish life. And so there was a spiritual decree in heaven that the Jewish people deserve a major punishment. That's how Haman comes to the fore. But the story of concealment is that since God's not, name is not mentioned, I told you once in the, in the Torah Megillah, it's because the whole story of Purim is, is, is a concealment. That's why we wear, well, it's one of the reasons why we wear masks and so we dress up on Purim. Why do we dress up on Purim? It's because we want to show that everything on Purim is not what it seems like on the outside. On the outside, it's a story that a king and a queen and the king, was, but it's not really what happened. Esther knew that she had no business convincing the king anything. It was the Jewish people repenting. The first thing that she told that, that Mordechai did was he gathered all the Jewish people and he told them that they had, he, he put sackcloth and he, he, was, he started, to, he started to, to cry in the streets and he gathered the Jewish people and said, we have to do Teshuvah, we have to repent for what we've, do, what we've done. The, many of the commentaries, all, all the commentaries point out, it's, it's, just, it's just an obvious thing. When in the history of the Jewish people did we ever have a Jew 
in the palace, as we did in the story of Purim. Think about this. Throughout thousands of years of Jewish displacement and exile, we were always powerless. We never had connections in politics. Maybe we, somebody who knew somebody, a finance minister, finance minister, a queen. The Jewish people never had someone so close to the top. What right? Moses. What was Moses' connection? He was, he was in charge. He was number two. But he was disowned. He was banished. Mother, Pharaoh wanted to kill him. Moshe had to run, run, run for his life. What about Joseph? Yeah, Joseph was a governor. Joseph was second in command. That is true. And so the time that Joseph was alive, he, he, life was great. But when Joseph died, it says, Pharaoh, like, like it never happened. Mm-hmm. Here you have a situation where a decree is being passed against the Jewish people. And if, and what's the first thing they do? Common sense would be, if you want, in, in the world of politics, you petition, right, the queen, if she's one of you, Right, the first thing we do is you have somebody. Mordechai himself was a, was a high-ranking official. Mordechai had saved the king's life in the beginning of the story of the Megillah. Mordechai saves the king's life. He hears he, he hears a plot to poison the king by two guards, and he saves the king's life. So the king owed Mordechai a big, a big favor. Mordechai, Esther, they're in the palace. The first thing they do is not convene a meeting about how we're going to make a delegation. How we're going to convince the king? Go to the king. The first thing they did was they started. They fasted. They start. They gathered all the Jewish people in, this, in all the synagogues in, in, in Shushan and Persia, and they, they, we have to we have to repent. Why? Because they knew that the decree that was hanging over them was not a, was a supernatural thing. It was a it was a it was a concealment of God, and therefore they had to channel it, they had to channel the response in a different way. So this is, when you look at the, the story of Purim, in a sense, is the last, is, is, it's the last, you know, great concealment that we have to look, we, we can look to, to see that within the concealment is the great miracle. So we wear masks. God takes his name out of the Megillah. The name Esther, it means concealment. Everything is concealed. Why? Because nothing is as it seems. The Jewish people had to look inwardly to understand that within concealment is great revelation. This is the, really a connection between the whole story of Purim and our Parsha, the Parsha of Tetzava. Because Kabbalah teaches that the greater the concealment, the greater the revelation that's coming after. What is the purpose of concealment? Concealment means that it's hiding something. The greater the something is, the greater the concealment needs to be. Right? There's a relationship between the core of something and the nature of what's concealing it. The, 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 the more subtle, the deeper the light, the greater the concealment. And so Purim, it says, is the highest light, it's the deepest light that we have, but it's also the greatest concealment. In the Zohar it says that the word Purim is even greater than the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur. In the Torah, Yom Kippur is called Yom Kippurim. It doesn't, it, doesn't say, it doesn't say Yom Kippur, it says Yom Kippurim. There's a term for Yom Kippur. The word Kippurim in Hebrew means Kippurim, like Purim. That Yom Kippurim is only like Purim. Purim is even greater than Yom Kippur. Think about this. They are separated by exactly half a year, and they couldn't be more different, but they're really the same. On Yom Kippur, we dress up too. We wear white. On Yom Kippur, we do the exact opposite. We, we are fasting. On, Yom, on, Yom, on Purim, we're feasting. On Purim, uh, we're, we're, we have revelry. On Yom Kippur, we're very serious. We're solemn. And yet the Zohar tells us that what, whatever happens on Yom Kippur through fasting and solemnity and wearing a, di- a different costume... We accomplish on Purim through joy, and it's even higher. So much so that Yom Kippur is only Kippurim. It's only almost like Purim, but not quite. So, what is the, what is the what is the essence of the holiday? The essence of the holiday is that we call it by a Persian name and not by a Hebrew name, because the concealment is teaching us that. If you want to find 
the truth, if you want to find the light, you have to know that this entire world that we live in, the word in Hebrew, olam, comes from the word halem, which means concealment. We live in a concealed world. We live a life where you can walk literally through your entire life and assume that this is it. And because I can't see, I can't perceive, and I don't feel anything different, there's nothing beyond the other side. And yet, life as a Jew means to be able to look, to break through whatever barriers are surrounding us, whether it's complacency, apathy, or that, the fact that we can't, we can't imagine that there's something deeper or bigger because it's hard to see it, it's hard to find it. But imagine this whole world that we live in is a bubble. Right? How many of you, 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 you have watched the movie The Truman Show, you know the show where he, he, his, his entire life is orchestrated, he lives inside, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 right? Matrix is how it's Okay. I'm, I'm old school. I don't oh. know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, but the, the, the idea is, is that we live our lives never imagining that, that there's more, that there's something deeper. Because the world is very, very thick. It's like, it's like a thick soup of concealment. God created the world and concealed himself in this world that God is only noticeable if we search. And so again and again, the Torah tells us that we should choose. And it says, it says, we, it says, 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 you want to find God, it says, only if you search for him, with all of your heart and soul. God made it that he's not easy to find. So people say, proof God exists. God doesn't want any proof in this world. God wants you to find, to search. If God was, if, if, if God was easily provable, if God was obvious in this world, then, and there was no concealment, then life, in a sense, becomes meaningless because there is no choice. There is no process of where I have to effect, cause and effect in my own life, where my choices become meaningful, where my life has consequence and has meaning. So God lives behind, a, 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 lives behind the veil. And it's up to us to penetrate that veil and find the light behind it. The same thing is true in Torah. God gave us the Torah, but the Torah has to be penetrated. It's, in a sense, the Torah is a big veil. The Torah is a curtain. The Ark of the Covenant was not on full display. It was always hiding behind a curtain of the Kodesh Kodashim. Anything that is sacred, that is real, it has to be searched. It has to be found. And there, 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 it requires a tremendous amount of fortitude and effort to find it. Why, and the, and the, why it is, is something that requires a lifetime of learning. But we know the, we, we know the, we know the effect. The, the effect is that just like we are body and soul, and we know we have a soul, but it takes a lot of effort to fully explore and become be in touch with our soul. It, it doesn't happen automatically. The same thing is true with connecting to Torah, with God's wisdom and will. You have to spend time and breaking your teeth and, and opening a book and creating, immersing yourself in an alternate reality. Being a Jew means accepting that there's an alternate reality. There's the reality that I see, the reality that I feel and touch, and then there's an alternate reality, the reality that God tells us about in the Torah. This is what, this is what the Jewish people were facing on Purim. Uh, in front of them, right, the story of Purim is that it seems like the answer is so obvious. We have a queen, we have Mordechai, let's just go knock on the door and say, and, and, and use our political connections, right? We, we, had, we had APAC, we had, we had the biggest APAC that we can have, right? But that's not what they did. It's not that we don't rely, it's not that we don't live normal pe lives as normal. Yes, they, eventually you, you have to use natural means. You have to use you have to use uh, political connections. You have to you have you have you have to you have to, you have to, you have to politic for sure. But a Jew has to realize that that's not the cause of your deliverance. It's a method of how can God will. But the true connection, the true miracle of Purim was that the Jewish people realized that not because. The decree happened not, not in a natural way, and the deliverance didn't happen in, in the natural way that people assumed it would happen. The same thing is true how, you, how, we, how we look at this parsha of Tetzaveh. 
the first word of this Torah portion is Ve'ata, and you. So even though Moshe's name is not mentioned, Moshe is certainly referred to. Moshe is, Moshe is talking in this whole Torah portion. It's not, that, it's not that he's gone. He's there. The word Ve'ata, which is the very first word on page 464, right? Yes. The word Ve'ata means and you. God's talking. Who's you? He's talking to Moshe. You is much, the, 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 the beginning is God talking to Moshe. It says, et b'nei You shall command the Jewish people. God is commanding Moshe to give over the command. So God is empowering Moshe through and you. In Kabbalah, it explains, why do we get so hung up on names? I, I told, I, I'm telling you until now that God's name is not mentioned in the Megillah. Moshe's not, name not mentioned in the Torah. Everything is concealed. But you realize that a name, according to Kabbalah, is a concealment in itself. Why is a name a concealment? Names are meaningless. You know why names are meaningless? Because the only reason why you have a name is for somebody else to call you. What do you need your name for? You ever call yourself by your own name? Somebody asks, what's your name? I don't need it. Right? If nobody ever, if nobody ever had to call you, let's say you lived, you're, you're the only human being on the planet, or you live in an island, <coughs> And you know, no one's ever going to call you. You need a name. What do you need a name for? Think about it. It's such a personal thing. The whole function of a name is for somebody else to call you. Right? So what is the name? The name, it's so personal, is a concealment of you. Because the ata you, the true you, the true core, has nothing to, has, goes beyond your name. God is telling Moshe of Atai, he's referring to Moshe that, that the you, you, the essence of you, is beyond, because your name, you didn't choose your name. Why is it, why, why is it, why is a name in the sense of facade? Because somebody else gave it to you. It's a mask. It's, it's a concealment. Your parents chose a name that they liked, or they researched, even if it has all the meaning in the world. It's something that was conferred on you by somebody else. And that's your name? No, that's their name. They chose the name. It's not my name. I didn't get to choose my name. And so we walk around concealed in a sense. Our name conceals, right? So say, who are you? Margaret. No. Who are you? What are you? The true you is deeper than your name. Your emotion, your intellect, your essence is beyond the name. Moshe his name was not really Moshe. Moshe had a name that was given to him by his parents. The name Moshe was given to him by the woman who found him. That's Moshe's, he's Moshe? It was named because she, dragged, she drew him from the water. The word Moshe means to drag from the water. See, she drew him, she drew him from, the, from the sea, right? But Moshe, God is telling Moshe, Moshe, you're, that's not you. You are deeper than that. This atab is an essence of a human being that is beyond labels. It's beyond description. When we talk about God, what do we, what, what do we say? Th- think about, how, how, do we, how do we refer to God? Hashem. Hashem. What does Hashem mean? The name. The name. Right? Hashem means the name. What do, we, what do you mean the name? I, I, said, I just said God. No, you didn't say that. You said the name. The na- well, which name? I'm not, even, I'm not even identifying which name. It, we, say in the, we say in prayer, before every single day on Shabbat, it says, it's a, it's a prophecy, right before Yishtabach, V'haya Hashem l'melech ha'kol ha'aretz, Bayom ahu, Yeh Hashem echad u'shmo echad. On that great day, God will be one and His name will be one. But until that day, there's God, and then there's His name. Right? So God, God's name, God's name is a concealment Right? Moshe wanted, the Torah tells us that Moshe wanted to see God directly. He wanted, he asked God to reveal his true essence. And God says, You cannot. No human being can know, truly know me. I'm unknowable. But I'm going to pass you, you'll see me from behind. Right? The name, we, we, when we refer to names of God, no matter what names, these names are descriptive of something that are all concealments. So we use the name Hashem, the name. But the name Adonai means Master. Right? Tzvaot, Shalom, Hamakom. These are all terms that we find in Scripture that are reference. Hakadosh Baruch Hu. These are all. What, what, what are all these? These are references to something, to an idea. Right? 
the blessed, the Holy One, blessed be He. Right? It doesn't tell me anything about what God is. So the name, God is, what God is conveying to Moshe is something very, very powerful in this parsha. That is, you might think that I'm taking your name out, and so it's a diminishment. I'm diminishing you. Oh, it's a punishment. Moshe's name is not mentioned once. God said, no. I'm taking one portion now. I'm elevating to you beyond your name. I want, to sh- I want you to know, I want to reveal to you your essential you, your essential core of who you are. It's beyond names. Just like I am beyond name, I'm talking to you, there is a you that only you know because your friends, your family know you by your past, by your proclivities, by your weird sense of humor, by your habits, by your, you know, your crazy twitches, whatever it is, right? But how you were in high school and, and if you were awkward in elementary school, everybody, right? This is how you're known. This is your, everybody has their reputation, has their name. But there's a you that you know, there's, a set, there's an essential self that nobody knows you like you know you. Because your name means, right? It's, your, it's what you build up. There's, there's, there's the you that's known by others, how they refer to you. And then there's the you, when you're locked within yourself, that nobody knows the real you like, of you. And over there, you're not calling yourself, but there's no name. There's no, there's no Sam, Bob, Karen, there's no name. It's you. And God is telling Moshe that you should know the if you want to know, the, 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 if you want to break beyond the concealment, you have to go beyond your name. I'm giving you a gift of you. The same thing is true of the story of Purim, of the Megillah. The Megillah teaches us that God is not hidden in the Megillah. God's name is taken out because the, because the name is a concealment. So what would the Megillah say? Adonai, Elohim, Hashem, great. What does that tell us anyway? You know what it says in the Megillah? It says in the, it says in the Talmud, it says every time the word Hamelech, the king, is mentioned in the Megillah, we think it's a reference to the king Achishverosh. It's really a reference to God. God is, right? God is the king of the universe. It says, Leib Sarim Hamelech Be'alash, the hearts of kings and princes are in the hands of God. God is orchestrating. The whole story of the Megillah is God's concealed hand working through the story that he wants the Jewish people to recognize that the laws of nature don't apply, right? If we were to sit down and say to ourselves that according to the laws of nature, this makes sense, or that doesn't make sense. We're, we're, we have a situation, right? There's a Haman in the world, so we need to, we, we need to make a... We have to form a committee, we should have a meeting, and we want, we want Mordechai to do this, we want Esther to do that. God wants us to know that that's not how it works. The Jewish people historically have survived because they are beyond nature. They live a, we, we've lived a supernatural existence. And therefore, the name of the holiday, the essence of the holiday, everything is done behind a, a curtain to teach us that we, and we choose, and we choose the, the, the term that Haman came up with, poor. That, that idea is a lottery means that we don't know the outcome. It can go one way or the other. I have, I have two numbers. And it can be this number or it can be that number. A true lottery tells us that I'm leaving it up to fate. <clears throat> so the story of poor is that God said, since the Jews are beyond nature... Therefore, we're not susceptible to lottery. We're not, we're not susceptible to uh, vagrancy or variances or of, of, of chance. See, Haman knew, the Talmud says, I'm, oh, it's more, a little more time. Haman knew that, that every time the Jewish people had been threatened before him, somehow, the last second, something happened, and God saved them, right? He sent them a savior somehow. So what did Haman want to do? Haman wanted, he didn't want to choose a day, you know, he wanted, he wanted to leave it up to, to chance, to, to a lottery. And because a lottery means that it's, it's illogical, right? It, it, it can happen at any time, in any way. <clears throat> so, one of the, one of the, interest, one of the ideas of, of Choosing is, I've, I know we've, I've done, we've studied this about this before, that true choosing means I have two identical things to choose, and I choose one over the other. 
You know, in common language, we, we, we use the word choosing all the time. I choose this, I choose that. But very rarely do actually human beings ever choose anything. The things choose us. So if I, so if I ask Noe, I'm giving you two options. You want a chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream? What do you choose? Vanilla. Why do you choose vanilla? Good. So you actually didn't choose vanilla. You have a personal disposition. You like vanilla better, right? So in a sense, the choice was made before I even asked you this question because since you have a liking for vanilla, it's not I see two things and I have to choose. The thing already chose you. Vanilla actually chooses Noe. Why? Because I like vanilla better. So where did, so where did, the, where did you actually make a choice? Now, this, this is a, it's, it's obviously... It's a deeper level of understanding of how choice is made. But when we talk about making a choice, it means that I made a choice. I could have gone choose, I could have chosen either way, but I made a choice. But really, you never really had a choice to make. Because if you really like vanilla better, then the two things are not equal. So how did you make a choice? I, I, if, I, if, I, if I ask you to, you know, to choose something that you like or something that you don't like, if I'm choosing things that are not equal, it doesn't make any sense. Right? But choose... If I choose a, a very fancy, expensive car or, or a used, cheap car, I say, okay, which one do you choose? Well, it's not really a choice. Well, a choice means that somewhere you are involved in making a decision that a choice, that I, I could choose one or the other, and for some reason I choose this. But if the reason is so compelling of why you're making the choice... And the choice was never a choice because the decision was made before you. the choice was, was presented to you. So if you're choosing something or someone because of a particular quality, then the quality already made the choice obvious. There was never a choice. So in Kabbalah says, strangely, how we would use the term choice, the only way a human being can ever choose anything is if I have two exact things and I tell you, Michael, make a choice. Choose. Look at this. Right? And now, this is where something deep in, this, in, the, in your soul, in your subconscious, right? I have to choose. So now, I wanted to share with you something a little deeper. But how is it a choice if they're exactly the same? It so, that, so, so, good. Great question. So why do you choose one over the other? You don't. You just take one. It doesn't matter. What made you choose that one over... Why didn't you, why didn't you take the other one? So, so I'm, I'm telling you, there's not just it's not nothing. There's something in within you, in, in your subconscious, in your soul. Your soul is choosing if it's exactly the same. There's, it's not random. But nothing in reality is exactly the same. Really? I'm, I'm giving. I'm, I'm, in your conscious life, let me. I'll give you. An, I'll give you. Okay. I'm, I take two two eggs out of a carton and I put it in front of you. I say, okay, choose one. They're exactly the same. Same shape, same weight, same color. And now, so you, you'll say, well, it doesn't make a difference. They're both the same. But you still chose one. Why did you choose it? That's random. Huh? That, if that's yeah, random. That's random. But, but one second. So what's random to you, Kabbalah says, oh, there, is a, it's not, there is such a thing as random. Random is a conscious selection that seems random because that's how God created the world. The world seems random. But everything is really a choice. God created real choice, but the choice is happening in the, in the, sub, in the subconscious. Think of, I want, so, every time, we, before you study Torah, there's a law, that before you study Torah, you have to make a blessing on the Torah. You're not allowed to study Torah until you make a blessing. You know, what is the blessing we make on the Torah? Huh? Right? Asha b'charbanu mikol amin. What does that word mean? What does the word bachar mean? Sure. God chose us. Why do we make that blessing every time we study Torah? That God, what do, what, 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 and what do you mean that God chose the Jewish people? Look, look at alternatives. Then, then it's not a choice. My whole point was, if, if the alternative is not good, then God didn't choose. That means we chose. Right? The choice, God, God didn't have a fair choice to make. Well, we chose God. That is true. But we say, Asher bachar banu, that God chose us. What, is, what does that mean? Question. If you say the bracha in the morning, it's good it for the whole day. Does yeah. it cover the whole day? Yeah. yeah. Make the, we make the, make the blessing once a day. Okay. So it means it's not random. 
It can't be random. But on the other hand, it ha- would have to mean that they w- that the truth is that everybody is the same. And for some reason, Asher Bachar Banan. Because if God chose us for a particular quality of the Jews, but the, the Jews are so intelligent, or we're so, uh, or for whatever reason, right? Then what kind of cho- what kind of choice was it? It's not a real choice. So this is what Haman was trying to tap into. Haman was trying to tap into the world where God that God allows things to what seem to happen randomly. There's a verse in the prophets that says, Hello, Ach Esav and Yaakov. Esav and Yaakov are brothers. They both came from the same father and mother. Right? One goes one way and one goes the other way. Right? Right? God chooses Jacob. But what causes it could seem so random. How can they, they were twins? Both born, they were both conceived, the same egg, everything, right? Radically different. So God teaches us that there is no such thing as random. Because random is a result of our conditioning to the world that we live in. Because in the world, we live in, we live in a world where it seems that random things happen. Right? So we assume that... But there is, in truth, beyond the veil, beyond the concealment of, concealment of the world, there is no such thing as randomness. There is choice. There is consequence. There's, there is a real beyond that. So Kabbalah was, what Kabbalah is saying is that, that you should realize that when you make a real choice means it has to be exactly the same. I'm not talking about artificial choice. I'm talking about when we talk about because yes, you can choose Cheerios over bran flakes or vanilla over chocolate. Those are it's great. Those are all great choices. Well, it says to choose life of life over death, right? But that's a, those aren't obviously equal. Then, then why does, if they weren't equal, then what is it? If, if, if choosing life was obviously such a better idea, then why would God tell you to choose life? That, that, that's my question. I'm asking. The answer is because in the real reality. It's, they, they look exactly the same. You don't know what's life and what's death. If, if choosing life was so obvious, then you don't need God to tell you Bakar to Why do so many people choose the opposite of life if, if, the, if, if, if it's so obvious that choosing life is better? It says like good and bad. Tov or right? In the puzzle. It says to Bakar to Bakhain, you should choose life. Yeah, it's, 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 like I said before. Right, so they say right. before you the good and the evil. Correct. Like, so it, so it, has to, it has to look different. Otherwise, if, if they look exactly the same, then they, they can't one be good or one be evil. The choice is very different. The choice is, when we make the choice, it's obviously, it's obvious. But the, the underlying, the, what's, what's underlying is what God is telling us is that a person can, t- can convince themselves, right, that what's Chaim is really Mabit and vice versa. People, p- people, people can, we, we can choose, we, first of all, we can choose for things that are bad for us. Human beings make those choices every single day. Right? Even we know it's a bad choice. We make that choice anyway for a variety of reasons. But sometimes, but, but the real choices are not always obvious. Because what, 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 we don't always know the result of a choice that we make now. When the Torah is telling us to choose life, it means that we should actively make the declaration that what the Torah is telling us that we think is random, that we think is not consequential. God is telling us, choose life because what the Torah is telling us, that's real. Because on the surface, it doesn't seem to be true. When you look at the world, it, it doesn't seem obvious that not eating this food that's not kosher is impactful. It doesn't seem obvious that on this day of Shabbat, that by abstaining from this, I'm doing something real. Because why? Choice. Friday and Saturday on the calendar look exactly the same. Walk out of your house on Friday and Saturday morning, and it looks exactly the same. And yet God is telling you, choose. Make a choice. Right? Choose Shabbat. Right? It's not obvious to make. It's not an obvious choice to make. It's not. You have to make that choice between two things that look exactly the same. And I'm choosing because God tells me choose life. So that's what. Of course, that's what the Torah tells you. Because otherwise, that choice would not be obvious. It wouldn't be obvious to a thinking human being living in a world that presents us that, that the world around us is fashioned in a certain way that those choices are very obvious choices. It's not because obvi- it's not obvious to live as a Jew. It's not obvious to live a committed life. It's not obvious to believe in something that you can't prove it, right? Rationally. So, going back to 
what happened on Purim. Purim is a holiday that we celebrate Jewish irrationality. We're celebrating the idea that what's real is what I cannot is what's concealed. What's real is what there's when people cannot identify you by name because you're wearing a mask, you're wearing a costume. That's the real you. There, the only time you the only time you're really you is when nobody can call you by your name. Why can't they, they, you know why they can't call you by your name? Because they don't know who's behind the mask. Well, if you got to be wearing a good costume for that. But the, the real you right, is when people cannot identify you, right? God was discovered by the Jewish people on Purim because they had to look within themselves. The easy way would be, Esther, go, go, go talk to Achashverosh. Right? That's the easy choice. That's the rational choice. But that's not, that's not what happened. And that's why Purim is a very, very unique holiday. And we go off, it's the only holiday where we go beyond rationale. We're told to behave in a way that's irrational. When, when the, the mitzvah is to Adaloyad, that means you get to a point where we don't know the difference between blessed is Mordechai and curses Haman. Why, 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 would, why? What's the point of losing control that way? Because Haman and Mordechai, uh, uh, there's a certain point where it's not. There's, there's no difference. What, what makes one curse? What makes one blessed? So Purim is telling us that we that we need to tap into a place where we are willing. To give up, to, to let our mind stop. Sometimes we have to we have to take some psychedelics and uh, some <laughs> other things, but to get to a point where we don't allow our mind to block our true choice. Your soul wants to choose, but our minds and our consciousness tell us it's not rational. It's not rational to live like that in 2018. It's not rational to make a choice because look 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 look, look at the world around you. The, the reality, this is reality. And Purim tells us, no. We're going we're gonna to say, the real reality is what I cannot see. The real I, the real story is what's happening behind the veil. The real I is beyond my name. And so, Tetzave and Purim, always, they coincide with each other this way. Mm-hmm. Moshe teaches us that if you want to, if you want, that it's not a step down to lose your name. To lose your identity, right, is a step up. It's to find the real you. God gives it to me this parsha, and the miracle of Purim is God says, "I'm going to do the same for myself." I took God took His name out of the out of the whole Megillah, but what does He do? God is present in the Megillah throughout, but it's not obvious. You have to you have to find it, right? The same thing is true in this parsha. So this is this is one of the one of the the confluence of ideas of this, of idea of how concealment works. The, the Torah tells us. The Torah warns us m- m- numerous times in the Torah. That God says, "I'm going to conceal." I, I, I'm, you should know that it's purposeful. That the concealment is purposeful, and it's only because God is asking us to search. God is, God is asking us to look. The, the Rabbi Levi Tzadik was a famous great Hasidic rabbi. I always used to say, he used to complain to God that it's not fair. He said, "He said the world you made is real and very obvious, and." And the truth you put in books, because but if you would have flipped it around and put, you know, put us in a world of spirituality, and put you know Hollywood in books, put you know or put you know, that, that you know, because in order to learn about, you know, in order to learn about God, you have to you have to you have to crack a book of two. You got to go to you got you got to. It's not, it's not a question of whether you're literate. You have to search God in, within your soul. So Rabbi Yitzhak Vedic always say that it's not fair what God did. He made, he made the obvious, right, fake, and the real, something you have to look for. He said if you would have flipped it, people would be a much, but obviously, the, why God did that, we won't know until the Messiah comes. But we, what we know is true. There are, there are many things in life that we know that, this, that it's a fact. Why it is, we don't have, we, we, we really don't know the depth of the answer. We do know, for example, that that in order to that that with great challenge overcome comes great achievement. That you have a greater feeling of overcoming something when you go through difficulty. If something comes happens very easy, you don't you don't feel a sense of accomplishment. That there the, or as Pirkei says, Lefum Sara Agra, that relative to the suffering and the pain of endurance, Agra is the reward. We know that. 
We don't, we don't argue that that's the case. We argue about why. Why did God create a world where, you know, God could have created a world where there is gain without pain, there is success without failure, there is completion without heartbreak, there is happiness without also feeling sorrow and joy. <coughs> but we do know that it's the effect. That should teach us that once we, if we're willing to break through that barrier that our minds put up for us all the time, that, it, that the very gift, that God, the logic that God gave us to, to, dwell, to contemplate and to meditate and to think beyond ourselves is also the number one challenge that we have to overcome that tells us that if it doesn't make sense, it can't be. If it's not rational, it's not valuable. And there, we need to, have, we need to go through a, a metamorphosis of concealment, of blocking out the obvious, blocking out the rational, and becoming irrational. Purim teaches us that the, de- the depth of Ju- Judaism is very, very irrational. So you can't live like that every single day of the year, but one day of the year is meant to convey to us that the greatest revelation is always by going through the greatest concealment first. And that's why Purim is the, is the epitome of that holiday. Yeah. Go ahead, Michelle. Go ahead. So uh, why did uh, God um, change uh, Jacob's name to Israel and uh, hold them the same as they hold them? I mean, if it's you know not a concealed name, I mean, isn't there something like mystical? Or why? So, that's a great question. But the name, the changing of the names in the Torah, identify a characteristic or an event that's going to happen in the lives of these people, right? But that again. An event that happens or a characteristic is only, excuse me, it's a parcel of your identity. Um, Abraham's name, Abraham was changed from Avram to Avraham because he became a father of many nations. That's all who Abraham is, that he's a father, right? It's a very important part of him, but there's a part of this, this, the depth, the essence of Abraham starts before he becomes a, a, a father of many nations. Jacob becomes Israel, right? Because he, he vanquishes an angel. But number one, it's temporary. Number two is it, 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 it identifies a characteristic of, of Yaakov that he's always struggling, he's always fighting. But I, I, would, would we say that the whole essence of Jacob, his whole essence is that he's a struggler? That, that's all he is? It's an aspect of his identity. A human being, the essence of a human being is it goes beyond specific characteristics. So if I would say, who are you? Well, you're the one, you know, it's not your title at your job. That's part of you. It's not the experiences you had at a particular time in your life. The name of Israel refers to a particular moment in history. It was a powerful moment, but he's much, much bigger than just that one moment of his life. So names throughout Torah tell us about particular events of people or aspects of their identity, but it doesn't give us an insight necessarily always about the the true essence, because the true essence, by definition, cannot be expressed in a name, because a name conceals that. So even if you're naming them at birth, it's only for their characteristic and event? Because this is before, not the aftermath, right? So, that's, so, so, so how, do we come, how do you come to, to, the, to the name, right? Because a child, the child can't choose the name. So you're choosing a name for your child. In, that, in essence, you're, you're deciding what's the, what you think is the best for that child, the best name. But... Why, why, do you, why, 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 would you, why do you choose this name over that name? Even in the best names, and you get it, if you get it right, is what I'm saying is it's still a conceal. It's still not the essence. But the, the, very fact that, the very fact that a parent chooses the name means that they're given a certain inspiration about that aspect of the person's soul. But it makes no difference whether it's before, at the beginning, in the middle, or after. It's because... By definition, why are you giving why are you giving a child a name? Hold on. Son, child, daughter, hey you, honey, right? Whatever it is. I mean, so why why does he need a name for? For social security number? For for what? For taxes? What? You have a child, right? And you love your child beyond. Forget the name. Why does the child need a name for? Why 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 isn't their identity as your child enough? In your communication with them, 
I'm, I'm, I'm not being rhetorical. In other words, yeah, most people are called by the names by who knows how many people. But as, let's, as a parent, let's, let's go back to the original point. Let's, never mind. Let's say you are going to be stuck with your child. You're going to be the only two people on the planet. So what's the name? What's the, what's the function of the name at this point? Because you can always... You, you can call them by any appellation that you want. They have an you, identity. How does the name give them an identity? It um, makes a distinction between that person. But, some, but if they're not... So, you, but you're, so you're saying that if there were no other people... So, and think about this. How superficial is the name, can, can a name get if the whole purpose of it is to make a distinction between that person yeah. just not to confuse them with somebody else? That's the whole reason we have a name. Yes, right? It, it's, it's so the mother can make sure that the child knows they're in trouble because they've listed all their names. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, if, if the whole purpose was just to distinguish people, then you would never have a number. So, yeah, you would never have a So I understand, why, I understand why we have names well, for uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the secular world, <laughs> but why we use the name when we call to, uh, for Riyadh to the... To the Torah, for example. I didn't say, but there, I, but I don't want anybody to walk away saying that names are not important because all I gave you tonight was one side of a coin, but but, there, and there's a, there's, there's a depth to that. But on the other hand, on the other hand, it does say that the night before a, a ch- parent gives a name to a child, Elijah the prophet comes and inspires the parent the name to give, and according to Kabbalah, your source of life comes through your name. The name is very important. Why? Because the, your energy of your life comes through your name. And the Zohar says when a person, God forbid, faints, one of the ways that we one of the ways that we revive them is by whispering their name in their ear, their Hebrew name. We whisper the name in their ear. Um, the name, especially when you name somebody after somebody, it draws down an aspect of that person's soul. So your name is super important. It's super important in the sense that it channels en- spiritual energy through your name to you. Right? Although that's true too. So but there's but Nevertheless, nevertheless, your name is still descriptive because it's affecting something. So even, even when we're talking about your name channeling your energy to you, your name is a conduit. But there's still an essence to you that goes beyond your name. And so, um, and so this, for, for, that's why in this world, Right? In the world of concealment, how do we identify? Through our name. Our name is the concealment of how, because people, it's very hard to bear your, people cannot express themselves, the I, you. Imagine every time you, you wanted to convey something to another person, you have to bear your soul. It's a very, it's a very, very, it's very harsh. Your name, in a sense, is almost like your mask of how, you, we're, so we're, we're all interfacing with each other through masks, right? Whether it's our name, or how we present ourselves, the words that we use, our attitude, or how we want people to perceive us, right? But then when we go home, we close the door, and we talk, and we're talking to ourselves. We 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 have a whole different vocabulary. We have, we have a whole different way of how we speak to ourselves because we know ourselves. We're not we're, we're not we're not we're not we're not putting on any assumptions or games. We're not trying to impress anybody. And this is, this is, in a sense, this, I think this is what the, what the Torah is trying to tell us, that for most, in our, in our consciousness, we function through name. Moshe, Avraham, right? It's, it's all through name. But at, there is a point that we have to realize that there's something deeper than that too. There's the, there's the one portion of the Torah that God wants us to remember. There's the one holiday of the year that we have to remember that we can't go through life always wearing a mask. You can't go through life without a mask either. But you can't go through life always think convincing yourselves that the, my identity is the aura, the perception that everybody else has around me. People are very afraid to break the perception that other people have about you. That's, right? People know me as this. And if I behave this way, if I say this, what are people going to think about me? Right? It took me years to build up that identity. But we have to have, to, 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 there's a certain courage to know that my real I, my real you, it's not all the things that people think about me. It's what I know about myself. If the events of Purim took place on Passover, why do you celebrate it at a different time? The story of, of Purim, I said, happened on Pesach. That's a, that's a time when 
Achashverosh, um, when, when, the, when, the, when the party happens when Esther outs Haman, and Achashverosh orders Haman to be killed, and the decree to be lifted against the Jewish people. What happened, though, is you have to remember that Achashverosh was a king over 127 lands, over the entire civilized world. Mm-hmm. Jews are spread in very, very far corners. In order for the edict to be passed, it took 11 months because armies all around in different countries had, had already gotten the decree the year earlier that on this day, on the 13th of Adar, we're wiping out the Jewish people, God forbid. So the story happened that it took, it took 11 months to retract that whole decree. And it was, it was only thir- 11 months later, on the 13th of Adar, that Achashverosh said that on this day, the Jewish people should get ready. Because there was no way, to, first of all, to forest- forestall everything around the world that the decree was over. Before, we're uh, now a month before Passover. So a month before Passover, when we, when we, what we celebrate as Purim is the day that the Jewish people rested following their deliverance from the, the, from the annihilation. So on the 13th of Adar, what happened, so what, what happened on the 14th of Adar? It said the Jewish people defended themselves and the army, the, and the Hashverosh army supported them and they, they, and they, and they, they stood down all the enemies of the Jewish people. The day after is when they rested, that's when they celebrated Purim. What happened was the next day Achashverosh comes to Esther and he says, is there anything else I can do for you? He's such a loving, attentive husband. Mm-hmm. Everything, you know, for, for, right? He almost killed her and I was to, what else can I do for you? <laughs> right? Typical marriage. So what do you say? What does Achashverosh say? And what does Esther tell Achashverosh? Yes, you can do me one more favor. The Jews in Shushan give them an opportunity. So that's why Shushan celebrates Purim one day after. And the tradition is that in Jerusalem, Purim is celebrated on the same day as Shushan Purim. So in Jerusalem, Purim is always a day later. Any city that had a wall surrounded, surrounding the city from the time of Shushan, from ancient times, from the time of Joshua, always celebrates Purim a day later. So this year, so for example, so Purim is celebrated in Israel, in Jerusalem. In Israel, everywhere, Thursday. In Jerusalem itself, it's celebrated on Friday. So, so what does that mean? It means that on the day later, the, the Jews of Shushan defended themselves, and they celebrated, as what we celebrate as Purim, is the day when the decree was finally lifted. But the story that put that decree, that, that the story that put that into play, happened 11 months earlier when Achashverosh formally renounced the decree. But it took a full 11 months for it to come to fruition. Does it make it make sense? If Achashverosh was in charge of the whole world, yeah, how did he have his downfall? So you see. <laughs> So Achashverosh is, first of all, um, the, the, the Talmud relates that the, the, it tells us all the names of the kings who ruled over the entire world. What, what, what was, why, why was the decree of Haman so calamitous? Because the Jews had no way to escape. Because Achashverosh controlled... What, 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 Haman, think about what Haman wanted to do. His ambition as, as an anti-Semite was unparalleled. Hitler... Yamakshima, may his name be erased, didn't couldn't conceive of eradicating the entire Jewish people in one day. He had it certainly. He was a very ambitious guy. He wanted he wanted he wanted to kill them all. But in one day, who can be that ambitious? Haman had it one. You know why? Because Haman had his, 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 his was able to deploy in every single place where Jews were. They had an army that was answering answering Tachashverosh. Hmm. Jews. There was no other country that had to be conquered. And it's called a Moshe of a Kippa. A Kippa is like a dome. The Talmud tells us that Achashir is a Moshe of Kippa. He was ruler over the entire dome of the, of the earth. There was nowhere to go. There was no known place that the Jewish people, there was no Amsterdam, there was no Portugal, there was nowhere to go. Right? That was safe. Alexander the Great, Alexander of Macedonia, there were, uh, um, there, were, there were only a handful of people that for a brief period of time controlled the whole known world. And that's why Haman had this idea that in one day, he, he, he could do it. It was, it was only, it's only possible in a situation where you control the entire, the entire planet. But how did Achishverosh <clears throat> lose his power? Every empire eventually loses their power. Achishverosh lost his power in the same way that Nebuchadnezzar lost his, his power. Achishverosh, um, eventually Achishverosh, um, the Persian Empire, allowed the Jewish people to go back to Israel. But the, 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 per, the Persian Empire was taken over by the Greek Empire. Right? Um, Militarily. Yeah. And eventually the Greek Empire was taken over by the Roman Empire. The, the greatest empires of the world were, had their, they, they had their 15 minutes on stage, but nothing lasts forever, right? Who was drinking too much? 
<laughs> no, so the, the, but the real the real answer to your question is I'm still, if I'm still on camera. The real answer the real, the, 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 the real answer to your the real answer to your question is that the Talmud says the reason why great empires lost their prominence is that when the Achashverosh was the Jews had left Persia and they went back to Israel. Once the Jews left, the Persian Empire started to go down. Histor the Talmud says historically, wherever the majority of the world's Jews lived. Their nation was the superpower. When, the, when they mistreated the Jews left, that empire started to go down. Isn't America Babylon, the empire? Certainly, but yes, America has, the United States has the world's largest percentage of Jews in the world. Right? The Soviet Union used to, at the time, oh. the Soviet Union used to have the largest number of Jews, and, um, but they're not the same empire anymore. And you know what? It can be traced. It went not 70s, 80s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. It well, it started earlier, but when they when they when they when they persecuted the, their their own Jews, mm -hmm. eventually Jews had to leave. You think that you, 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 there's no correlation to the fact that the empire went down has the fact to do that mass immigration. The, the Jews they, they they are no, no longer the uh, the empire where the majority of the world's Jews are. Uh, what about the Jews that are leaving France now in Poland? Because of anti-Semitism. Those are hardly superpowers, France and Poland. But they used to be. They used to be. At the time, in medieval ages, Poland, France, England, when the majority of the world's Jews lived in those territories, they, they were powerful empires. The, the reason why I'm saying this, by the way, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a question, it's not, it's, not an issue that, it's, it's, not, it's not an issue that the Jews were the ones who made these empires migrate. It's a promise that God made to the Jewish people. The, the Talmud tells us that one of the ways that God softened the blow of exile God told the Jewish people, it said, he said that the Jewish people will never be subservient to a lesser power of its time. That at least the, the power that controls the Jews will be the superpower of its time. So, so in, in a sense, that, that this was the, the uh, bomb that God was giving the Jewish people, that as long as God says, I'm giving them into, I'm giving the Jews over to these people's hands, as long as they as long as they um, treat them relatively well, then they are, they are God's messengers of, keep, of the Jews in exile. Once they turned on, Egypt was the superpower of its time when the Jews were in Egypt. Go back. It, it, Egypt was the superpower. Once the Jews people left Egypt, Egypt, goes, Egypt did, did not last very long as an empire, uh, that much longer. It, this has been the story Rome when Rome controlled Israel, you can go back, it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not even Jewish history. Go back, read secular history. The Roman Empire goes down, right? After, after the destruction of Israel, right? It doesn't last, and specifically in the second and third century, Rome, Rome, doesn't, Rome doesn't last that much longer um, once Jerusalem is finally decimated in the end of the second century. They, they, they had their time, right? But this is, Go. This is, uh, you know, Spain in, in, the, uh, in the in the twelfth and thirteenth century. Spain, right? When Spain was sending the uh, when, when when Columbus went out, Spain was the uh, Spain was the light of was the jewel of Europe, right? After after they expelled the Jews in fourteen ninety two, Spain starts to slip. Within a hundred years, Spain is no longer the, it's no longer everybody's big brother anymore, and, right? It, it shifts. The Central Europe. He, he brought up China now. I mean, China's pretty powerful these days and doesn't have Jews in it, as that I know of. First of all, uh, um, powerful, you're talking about as an economic power, as yeah. a military power, as well? Economic. It's because Jews are buying everything from China. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, they're the most powerful country yet. <laughs> like, it should be it's the most powerful. It, it's, yeah. And, and, and there may be, by the way, there, there may be lots of Jews in China from the, from the ten lost tribes. We don't know. We don't know. It could, it could be all the. It could be all the Chinese are uh, lost Jews. We don't. Know. I, 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 the way that I thought you were you formulated it was any place where the majority of the Jews are will be a superpower. That doesn't mean that every superpower has to have the majority of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll I'll defer to Michael's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But I, I mean, the consensus is that there is only one superpower in the world today. China is a power; it's an economic power. Right. But it's, it, it's uh, China. China's, China's influence in the world 
is more is, is, is related to e- economics and production and labor rather than influence, cultural influence. Certainly is not the cultural influence of China. The cultural influence of America is everywhere in the world, right? You can speak English is understood everywhere in the world. Um, Mandarin is uh, only a, only if you need a very good contractor in the outer Richmond. <laughs> it's not going to it's, it's not going to help you in many other places. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna do, so let's do the Shavu Brachot. Well, we'll wait for you. Good <laughs> sure. timing. Do you want your business? For those ones, <laughs> Az yam rovaga yim yeladona elasoti mele yigad yeladona elasoti manu ha yinu semechim shuva adona yat shivitenu kafikim banegev ha wasorim bedima berino yitzaru haloch yelechu b'chav nasi meshech azara b'hayavo verina nasi alumot Okay. So we're going to turn to page 60. I, 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 I don't know if I've written the same one. I think so, more or less. Okay. Um, Eighty one.